Hey fellow Spartans, it's your friend Monocle Mayhem, the entirely blue Spartan. It's been an interesting couple of months for the Halo community. For some, it's disastrous, or an incredible time to be a Halo fan, or just, eh, pretty cool. Yeah, things are looking up. The Halo Infinite campaign reveal has passed, finally giving desperate creators something to talk about other than toys or speculation and hype videos. The Step Inside trailer, an 8 minute campaign demo, and a trailer for an 8 minute campaign demo. Huh, okay. And in the aftermath, some extra details being dropped by 343 themselves. I would have liked to take part in the hundreds of YouTubers live streaming, but I'm busy and avoid live events for reasons. I know I saw Clone Wars. God fucking damn it. So I was okay with getting home from work and watching the videos once they got uploaded. Now some of the community's reaction to the demo ranged from one extreme to the other. Excitement or disappointed. I'm in that nice middle ground of pretty cool, can't wait. Graphics need work though. Let's get into my reaction to the trailers, demo, news, and ultimately, <laughs> laugh at everything going on in all of that. It all means nothing. Until you step inside. Up first, we have the Step Inside trailer. It was a nice way of generating hype for the new game while also saluting the last two decades of Halo. Someone, who I assume to be Halsey, gives a nice short speech along the lines of the armor doesn't inspire hope, rather the person wearing it. I feel like in a meta sense that was Halsey talking to all her Spartans, aka us. Perhaps that's not what you got out of it, but that's how it came off to me. A nice tribute to the legacy of Master Chief. Then we get the demo. Off the bat, the music was incredible. It was different, but still felt like Halo. Was that too much to ask for? Something brand new, but still belongs? Finish the fight from Halo 3 is very different from Halo 1's theme, but still hits the same notes. It just sounds different because of its narrative purpose at that point in the story, and the same is going on here. This sounds like Halo, but complements the direction of the story. This is a Halo ring again, but everything has changed. We're up against a new threat, this is a new adventure. 343 wasn't just spitting out jargon when they called this a spiritual reboot. Nothing can undo the past mistakes, but how this next chapter is being presented makes it feel like a true sequel to Halo 3. Imagine Halo 4 opening with this music. Halo 4's story wasn't nearly as destructive as Halo 5's, but I think fans would have transitioned into the new series a lot easier if this was how we set out from the start. Very different, but a lot of indicators that this is the same series. That goes for the art style and sound as well. Now, you could argue that we're just a bunch of fanboys that hate change and would cream over the most minute hint of nostalgia. But this is still vastly different from past games, it just benefits from still looking like it's in the same universe. A lot of details have changed, but they still fit in the same silhouette. The art style looks like Halo should look. But that's a topic for another day. I'm just glad that there was an attempt to please both sides of the fanbase. Not everyone is happy, but it's better than having never listened at all. Now, in short, the gameplay looked like fun. It made me want to get my hands on it. At its most basic, it seems to take elements from past Halos and reasonably balances them. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You were thinking that? 
I can't die. do it. Surprise! I've got double thick thighs. They didn't remove Sprint. I wanted Halo, not Call of Duty. Yeah, we get it. Look, I'm not a fan of Sprint either, but we have to take what victories we can. It's just that, with all the new things, there's so much more to admire than focus on the Sprint debate. But while we're here, it looks really nerfed compared to Halo 5. Maybe, just maybe, it can work when modified properly. But that brings us to the topic of advanced movement and abilities. Like it or not, there's two styles of Halo. You have Arena and Big Team Battle. Both require starting at simple same starts for each player. Halo's weapons, equipment, and abilities are minimal in comparison to other games, but the fact that you can't choose what you begin with makes for a huge sandbox to play in. You don't spawn with your ideal loadout. You search and build up your arsenal as you fight on the map. And once you have a map memorized inside and out, that's the key to dominating the arena or battleground. Some may not like it, but that's Halo. Let's see, you have Sprint from Reach and Onward as a base trait, typical mix of weapons that have various advantages and disadvantages, and equipment from Halo 3? Damn, that actually surprised me. And you can pick up and throw explosives? That's new. And the new grapple hook. The grapple hook isn't even Halo. It feels like a ripoff of Doom Eternal's meat hook. Hmm, where have I seen this before? It has a grappling gun straight from Just Cause, which, I mean, it's kind of stupid on paper, but it looks okay in the footage. It's bizarre. In fact, everything Bethesda has been doing this year is bizarre. Now, the grapple hook is interesting. People assume that because it slowly recharges, that it was another ability, but it has been confirmed that, at least in multiplayer, it will be an on-map pickup like equipment. But equipment is one-time use only. Once you deploy a power drain or bubble shield, it's gone. After it temporarily does its job, you have to go out and find a new one. I'm thinking that it's going to be like armor abilities from Halo Reach or 4, but instead of spawning with it, you have to go out and find it. Now, there are those haters of Halo Reach and Halo 4's armor abilities, but I personally feel that people's outrage stems from how they were implemented, not because they don't belong in Halo. You know, there is a lot of things that OG fans love that at one point were believed to not work. Like, playing as the Covenant in Halo 2 was kinda bitched about, but that led to the greatest team-up in the series, and a new path of customization. Even equipment from Halo 3 caused some controversy, but it went on to become a fan favorite. A big mistake that Bungie made was making you spawn with loadouts, which carried over into Halo 4, but there was never a separate set of playlists that featured armor abilities as on map pickups. Not even in the Master Chief collection. There's an entire playstyle that contributed to the classic Halo sandbox that we never got. But the way the grapple hook is said to perform kinda matches up with on map armor abilities. Now that's kinda my speculation. Armor abilities returning and not ruining the classic style, but still evolving it by adding more to the sandbox for players to fight over and dominate the map with. Only for Sprint to ruin it all. No, no, no. Let's just let that go for now, okay? Anyways, default Spartan abilities seem to be gone, leaving just Sprint, Clamber, and Slide. If Clamber and Crouch Jumping work together with Clamber being a noob's Crouch Jump, then I really don't care. And Slide is tied to Sprint, so they're kinda in the same boat. But this looks like abilities have been massively toned down. No charge, ground pound, ass boosters, hovering. Maybe, if Halo Infinite relegates this advanced movement shit to on-map pickups, Sprint can work in the sandbox. I mean, Sprint has always been one in many default spawn abilities. But if Sprint is the only substantial base trait as well as being toned down a bit, it may not screw with map balance in size. Armor abilities can exist on small maps, if it's a rare thing that only pops in at random intervals of a map that each side has to fight to acquire, while also being peppered around big team battle maps. Bottom line is, Grapple Hook looks like fun. It won't fuck with the map size and balance if it's not something everyone spawns with. Either way, we'll just have to see how it plays when we get our hands on it. Now, this is something that I suspected would cause even more triggering than the grapple hook. We can now pick up and throw explosives, but I think this can be balanced very easily. I think the splash damage and overall damage will be greater than maybe a rocket. That's a pro, but the cons will be someone else can shoot it as you're holding it, 
or just shoot it before it hits them. So it could be very effective at taking out someone easily but can be countered. That pro versus con balance is Halo. Like some weapons are great on unshielded targets, but don't strip shields as well as plasma weapons do, with plasma weapons not being as good at taking down targets with a strip shield. That balance of pros versus cons looks like it's not being forgotten when adding new things, and that's good. We'll just have to see. Let's get the two big elephants in the room out of the way. So the Magnum and the shotgun's designs have changed. It pissed off some people, but it was mild disappointment for me. Like yeah, the pistol looks kinda different, but it's not that bad. Plus it looks like it functions relatively similar to the Halo 5 standard and gunfire pistols. Either way is fine with me. I feel like Halo Reach 4 and 5's pistols got it right. They're not overpowered like Halo 1 or a pea shooter like Halo 2 and ODST's pistols. Or the very interesting version in Halo 3. Yeah, yeah, it sucks, but if it still functions like the pistol, I'll be fine. The shotgun was heavily redesigned, and seems to function differently from previous versions. For new weapons, we have the Mangler, a brand new and deadly looking banished pistol. It functions like a revolver, so that would be cool to play with. I like how similar it looks and functions to the Mauler. It makes the Brutes look like they have some level of consistency with how they make their weapons. VK-78 Commando. It seems to function like a middle ground between the DMR and Assault Rifle. Pulse Carbine. It looks like a mix of the Carbine and Plasma Repeater from Reach. I really like how this, the Storm Rifle, and Carbine look the same. Again, making these rifle-esque weapons have a consistent style. Ravager. Looks like a cool blend of the Concussion Rifle and a Brute Shot. Of course we have a lot of returning weapons mostly appearing how they should, the Assault Rifle being more prominent. Some people don't like how the Reach AR looks, but at least it didn't look like this. Some feel like these guns look too generic. The Commando looks and operates like a gun from Destiny. I haven't played Destiny, and without that pre-existing bias, I think it looks fine. Yeah, a bit generic, but at least it has the average accuracy of most of the ranged and automatic weapons in Halo. So it's not too much of a departure. If its colors were more black and gunmetal, then I think it would be perfect. Plus, if it is like a gun from Destiny, how is that a bad thing? Bungie made it, Bungie supposedly knows Halo, especially when they made the first Destiny, and Halo is their most consistent experience in first person shooters, so... What's the complaint here? As for the shotgun, at least its design is a bit simpler. If I can't have the classic shotgun, I'd take this over the Halo 4 version. But we will eventually get the classic pistol and shotgun. Yeah, it sucks, especially after their first go at changing a weapon design. But if they come back eventually, that's better than not at all. There seems to be some confusion over the difference between graphics and art style. People have blamed the game for looking bad because of Halo Infinite looking like some of the Bungie era designs. But that's just simply false. Art style is how something tangibly looks. The silhouette, shapes, colors, placement of noticeable and subtle details of characters and the world around them. Graphics is how it's visually presented. As a digital artist and artist in general, I need to know these things. I'm not the best, but I remember what I'm taught. No, the art style is not the issue. The graphics are. They're not exactly refined. You can make anything look bad if the graphics don't do it justice. Just look at these Halo 5 models being used in the Halo Custom Edition graphics engine. Halo 5 is graphically superior, but if that Halo CE mod looked like our first introduction to Halo 5, I think people would have reacted the same way. Or even Halo 2's old and remastered graphics. Now that we got that cleared up, let's move on to our lineup of opponents. The Brutes are a continuation of how they were presented in Halo 2 Anniversary and Halo Wars 2, from their design to the weapons and vehicles they use. Some may not like the shaven look they have, but it kinda lines up with what we got in Halo 3, Reach, and even Halo Wars 2. I prefer the hairier look of the Brutes in Halo 2, but I feel like we're going to get a mix of both, with the new Brute leader Eshiram having big hairy brows and a beard. But some have compared them to the drones from Gears of War. <sighs> yeah, more. Comparing to other games. What's new?
Never mind them being clearly ape-like and not muscly reptilian things. Grunts are a nice mix on the Halo 4 designs with Bungie-era armor. I would have liked to see them go all the way, but close enough, oh well. Jackals have reverted to the bird, avian raptor designs rather than the reptile dragon things of Halo 4 and 5, and even some Halo 1 inspired armor. Huh, not even the remastered version went that far. Now Chief undeniably looks more polished than everything else here, but his armor was finished two whole years ago, and has only gotten more refined as time went on. So I'm overall pleased with the enemies, they all look great, and the only thing holding them back is the graphics at that current state of the game. The reaction to the graphics at this point in time was kinda positive, but a lot of people weren't pleased, and reasonably so. But then you have the fanboys and haters coming in. The apologists giving 343 a big sloppy reach around, and really trying to hammer it home that the graphics look amazing and are flawless. And the haters giving less than optimal takes on the graphics. I delved into some of these comments, forum posts, and threads trying to implore people to give some legitimate criticism on the graphics. Something realistic, specific, or insightful. But more often than not, it boiled down to hyperbolic comparisons to Xbox 360 graphics. As a next generation game, graphics shouldn't look like GTA 4. Okay, okay, let's go. I have been playing GTA 4 on and off lately, and no, you, no, the graphics are dated. They just are. I love the game, but no. It's fine if you are memeing on a meme group or whatever, but this adds nothing to the conversation. GTA 4's graphics have even more pop-in textures and less detailed graphics. Like, I get the joke, but it adds nothing to the criticism of the game. Some people seriously use Craig as a point to back up their so-called argument, and that's just hilarious. Again, I, I love the meme, but it's still a non-issue. I didn't care about Craig's face, I watched it like a normal person. Yeah, that split second close-up was funny, but so is any freeze frame. It's just interesting that so many people use that meme to bolster the argument, but I still think these brutes in the demo look better than most past iterations of the brute. Once some more dynamic facial animations are added in, it will look great. But it's laughable when people say that Halo Reach or even Halo 3 graphics are better. Great designs, but come on. Come on. We don't know a whole lot about Halo Infinite's story right now. Only that 343 is slowing down and going back to basics. The events of Halo 4 and 5 still matter, but they are not crucial to your enjoyment of the story. But I still wonder how many characters are being carried over. So far Master Chief is the only returning character from the previous games. Cortana has been hinted at, but we haven't even seen a glimpse of her. No Halo 4 or 5 characters. I feel with the proposed 10 year plan for Halo Infinite we are going to get your average campaign, semi open world, but still has linear campaign elements. And in the coming months after release, I think we will get campaign DLC much like Awakening the Nightmare from Halo Wars 2. The 10 year plan for this game has people worried, but we'll ultimately have to see how it turns out. Just because it hasn't worked for some other games doesn't mean Halo Infinite will also follow suit. Yes, it's a risk, but I'm focused on the positives that can come from this. Hell, we can even look back to the Halo franchise for the do's and don'ts. Awakening the Nightmare was really good. Maybe you don't like the direction of Halo Wars 2's story, but honestly, I personally feel it's the best of the 343 games. Either way, the gameplay was just as solid as the original campaign. Spartan Ops from Halo 4 was a great idea. It really was but it felt stuck between being a successor to Firefight and being light campaign DLC. Sure, the episodes are pointless now because Halo 5 invalidated everything it set up, with the rest being finished off in a fucking comic book. The episodes are still cool, but the gameplay made no sense. You had reused campaign locations and played it as your multiplayer Spartan, and most of the game was either holding out or destroying copy and paste objectives. So, you aren't playing as these characters, or you are, but they're using your custom armor? I'm still confused. Even when entirely new locations were added, they were ruined by being copied over and over again. 
it's okay if campaign DLC is short, just as long as the story is relevant to the overall story and the gameplay is dynamic and creative. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe the 10 year plan is focused entirely on the multiplayer and custom games. That's cool, but 10 years without a brand new campaign seems a bit long. I have some optimism when comparing Spartan Ops to Awakening the Nightmare. I just hope that if DLC is a plan, that it focuses on quality over quantity. I think some characters will be killed off. Ones that are utterly forgettable go. While the ones that have potential and are already appreciated are returning. Maybe over the course of the campaign we get hints early on at who died. Maybe teaming up with a stranded character or more and having them killed in whatever fights may come. This could serve as showing how deadly your enemy is while also making room for better pre-existing characters. Perhaps Master Chief suspects his team is gone. Osiris, Infinity, Swords of Sanghelios, all gone or mostly gone, and he reunites with the remnants of all those teams and factions to build up his war against the Banished and other possible threats. Even though Osiris sucked, almost everyone sucked in that game. But the underdeveloped new characters can come back maybe as background characters that are focused on in the expanded lore. Where good writers have the room to do them justice, and all the characters that matter being more present. There was a toy released where a brute has Locke's helmet welded to it like a trophy kill. I mean, that's not the worst idea. Our main cast looks like a good lineup. Master Chief feels like he should. A character, yes, but one that a player can step inside and experience the story and world through. Kinda like the good old days. I really like the pilot. He's filling out the Cortana role, faux hammer role, and comedic relief role. In just a few minutes of screen time, I, I love him more than any character from Halo 5. He's a coward, but he truly thinks the war is lost. He thinks he saw the worst of it. All he wants is to return to his family, to see his kid that's growing up without him. Where Chief balances him out and helps him in his own way, shows him how to fight when his back's against the wall, inspires him to finish the fight. When he first found Master Chief, he seemed to kind of selfishly think he was his ticket out of this nightmare. And I think in the adventure that awaits them, the pilot will find his courage and face the nightmare instead. We see why we should care about him through the basics of storytelling instead of exposition. Show, don't tell. We see he has a family out there. We see he's scared, his conflict, but his loyalty to a hero as well. If the writing was being handled like Halo 5 script, we would have been told these things in some bland, unemotional dialogue. Jules getting desperate. How'd you learn to speak Sanghealy, Vale? When I was a kid, I was stuck on a diplomatic shuttle adrift in deep space for six months. My options would be real bored or spend the time getting smart. Now we get a new bad guy, Escherum. Some people have complained, of course, that he's boring and stupid off of 20 seconds or so. Yeah, because Halo is known for stellar writing. But there's some choice dialogue this that's about to dialogue. happen. Where Captain Talk about Key, exposition. Yeah, well, you know, he is Captain Exposition. That was our nickname. We cut oh, yeah. the level where we, in a more elegant way, described this. What do they call it? They call it Halo. <laughs> well, of course they do. Halo. <laughs> <laughs> Chief uh, takes it in stride, come on. Yeah. Chief knows exposition when he hears it. Ma'am, squad leaders are requesting a rally point. Where should they go? To war. Others wondered where Atriox is. I was also caught off guard by his introduction, but it makes sense to me. As much as I like Atriox, I want to get as much of him as I can and be a true threat. I hope he takes the role kind of like the Prophets. He's there pulling the strings of the Banished and maybe you fight him a few times. I hope he has a satisfying death or maybe even some kind of redemption if possible. By adding a character like Eshram, it gives us more than one antagonist, the first of many threats in the war to come. But in just a few lines, I'm already interested in seeing what is done with him. I don't think his appearance in the demo is exactly our first real introduction to him. More like a tease, kind of like the first time we saw the Warden in the Halo 5 demo. 
Yeah, he sucked, but it was still a brief rundown of what role he'd play. I just hope 343 learned from him and makes Eshram a real challenge that stands between you and the bigger threat. I kinda get Boros from One Punch Man vibes from Eshram. If that's the direction that 343 is taking him, I hope they do it right and don't half-ass it like Halo 5 did with every character. Maybe Eshram will get super pissed off when his forces keep getting wiped by the Chief, but hypes him up for coming face to face. Or maybe Chief gets his ass handed to him and he makes a comeback, re-strategizes with a Rocky IV type montage for the next battle. We now have a longer wait ahead of us than we originally thought, but I'm still excited for a good and balanced story. Now, the game was delayed. It was scheduled for the holiday of 2020, but now it's going to be somewhere in 2021. The holiday of next year seems kind of far, possibly a summer release. Either way, I can't really see this as a bad thing, no matter what side of the fence you're on. Yeah, it sucks, we'll have to wait longer, but if the game wasn't ready yet, are we really missing much? If you were insane fanboy levels of excited, that means it will only get better, and if you were unimpressed with the graphics, thought it didn't look next gen, perhaps this is the time needed to get there. When news dropped about the delay, I was kinda surprised, but when you think about it, it kinda makes sense. Now, this is a bit of the negativity, our side versus their side situation. Before the delay, we thought that Halo Infinite was going to be in a brutal time crunch, or that the demo was anywhere between a couple months or weeks old, with the current product looking better and everything is going to come into place in the final months. It's kind of funny. I don't know where you guys were looking throughout all this. I never got too deep into all the debates and toxic arguments, but across numerous forums, it seemed like there was two vocal sides. Either you were gushing between the legs over this game like a girl at a boy band concert and love anything and everything Halo, if Bonnie Ross took a shit and stamped the Halo logo into it, you'll put that shit in a glass case. Or you're a hater, a negativity whore that simps for the classic games no matter what. Nothing that 343 does is good enough, 343 simply existing kills you inside. And the comfy middle ground, aka the majority, got caught up between these two extremes. The majority of Halo fans are not this cringe and toxic, it's just funny to me how intense these sides can be. In any fandom, it's fun to step back and look at the conversations going on. It's like real world politics, but it's people arguing over games. People on the far end of one side thinks the other is stupid, they're objectively right, and any form of disagreement should be met with hostility. I know I have some strong opinions, and I lean more to one end of the fan base than the other, but I still see a lot of merit on the other, and that's where I'm at through all of this. And it's funny seeing people with these extreme hot takes. I mean, even as someone who doesn't focus on graphics that much, the demo still left me wanting more. There was noticeable amounts of texture pop-ins and some models weren't as detailed as they could be. Now, this doesn't bother me too much. I thought around four months was a good time to fix any issues with the graphics. I'm not an expert, but I do a lot of messing around in Blender, Unity, and a bunch of various softwares. I refine a lot of my digital art and 3D related skills through tutorials, trial and error, and mini projects. But I know if you have a team of hundreds working on one specific thing, a lot of change can happen in a few months. I thought the graphics were subject to great change when I first saw them, and I just didn't get so worked up. But the goddamn people raging over the graphics was pretty damn funny. No, I do not mean the YouTubers and many other fans giving their thoughts on the demo was blind hate. It was all very constructive and raised interesting points. I mean the toxic ass fans that use hyperbole and baseless opinions and straight up hate and calling it constructive criticism. Here we have a petition titled, Stopping Halo Infinite from Being Developed. <laughs> Nobody started signing yet. Maybe if I read off the description, you can all be convinced. This is a catastrophe of game in development, and to save the community and any person before even viewing this, I want this to be cancelled before they drive the final nail in the coffin to kill Master Chief. 
they shall lose all rights to establishing any game further from this point on. Oh, the salt. Give me more salt. Like I said, the demo was underwhelming graphically, but it still showed promise. Fucking chill, dude. I know Cortana isn't quite the waifu material you were hoping for, but hang in there. We can still salvage those titties. <laughs> Here we have a post from Boomerbook, someone being reasonable, expressing disappointments but optimism for the good that the delay may bring. But as we all know, positivity and logical thinking is not allowed by the gatekeepers of any fanbase. As disappointing as it is, isn't this really the right call? In its current state, the game wouldn't be ready by December. This means they can really take their time to polish the gameplay, graphics, and animations. Overall, the right decision in my opinion. I totally agree. With the delay, it kind of signaled to me that there was a lot more going on with the game than troubling graphics. If Microsoft forced 343 to keep going, we would have had another game with minimal content, possibly broken, and heavy reliance on post-launch updates, filled with content that should have been there at launch. Allowing 343 more time to work on the game is a good move. This is a massive title for them, and it seems like all around, both 343 and Microsoft are putting more consideration into the making of these games, and honestly is a very pro-consumer move. The wait will be longer, but this is more time to fix issues. There is hopefully nowhere to go but up. But then the negative Nancy comes in. I am actually surprised by most of the community being okay with this. Letting 343 know to take their time, which is fine. I am pretty disappointed to be completely honest. I mean, it's going on 6 years now. Like, what in the hell are they doing? Halo CE 2001, Halo 2 2004, Halo 3 2007, Halo 4 2012, Halo 5 2015. They gotta do what they gotta do, but why a 6 year gap? Really, really don't want to hear an excuse of COVID-19. Oh my god, the total lack of the most basic understanding of game development and the world right now is astonishing. Okay, three year gaps between games was enough time back in the early 2000s when the graphics were so simplistic and where the overall technology had progressed at that point. Once we got into the late stages of the current gen, it was starting to look like games needed more time. The graphics are not the walk in the park they used to be. That costs more time and effort than the generations of old. Halo 3 fits inside at least 15 gigs of space. Halo 5 is at least 100 gigabytes, and Halo Infinite's campaign is supposed to dwarf anything in past games. That's not even including multiplayer. Now, I hate to give you a reality check, but uh, the pandemic is the reason the game was delayed. I wish my life was as special and carefree as yours, but yeah, a lot of shit has changed. Big secret, but I love you guys, so I'll share it. 343 is run by people. And like you and me, people have families that they take care of. They have to focus on the expenses of their home, food, transportation to and from work. Just a small example. As much as the people I work with would love to put the time into their job that they used to, the pandemic really screwed up a lot of things. This isn't the status quo. One of my friends at work had to take turns with his wife to look after their kid because daycares have shut down. Then they have to work out the consequences of them both working less and how it affects this and that. My guy, shit ain't right these days. So. If that's your opinion, I gotta say, I wish I could respect it, but it's just stupid. There are people working for Microsoft and 343 that have more on their plate that's more important than a game. It's not fun, but that, that's just what it is. The game was meant to be five years, but the challenges that the pandemic brought slowed everything down. The only businesses that are working tirelessly are essential services like grocery stores at the cost of a lot of the people working for them. I should know, I have to bust my ass for a grocery store. A big one at that. So unless you're a celebrity that thinks singing will help people get by, I doubt all the grunts for those studios are putting all their focus onto their job when there's bigger things happening. 
I don't like getting serious, but that's just what it is. That five year progress probably turned out to be more like four years and maybe three months or so of progress. Either way, it's obvious the delay was needed. Games aren't important, but the safety of your loved ones and fellow man is. It's just hardly an excuse when you take a second to look around and use an ounce of brain power. Anyway, let's look at more of the reactions to this delay. Good, maybe they can fix the graphics. You know what? No. No, with the extra six or seven or eight or nine months, they're just gonna sit down the game and go out partying. N nah, I I'm sure they will. Maybe. Possibly. No shit. How many years has this been in development? And now all of a the sudden, they're blaming COVID-19? 343 is a- 343 is fucking joke. It's like if they love disappointing their community. Hey kiddo, I know schools are shut down, but that's no excuse for your grammar to take such a dip. I'm no scholar in the subject by any means, but I figured out grammar at the age of 10. I think maybe you might be able to win some people over if you didn't make yourself sound like a complete moron. Time to fit in more false advertising and a completely different storyline. Wow, this video is tough for me, because I am not a 343 apologist at all. I call them out on their bullshit, but I will praise them when they do something right. But these morons are so damn aggressive that they make the simple act of correcting them look like you're doing a favor for 343. Understanding? This is bullshit. I wanted it so fucking bad. <laughs> I just can't do it. I can't take this shit no more, man. Hate to get political, but this is Def Sia. The government can only do so much to impact your life, but the left's control of private enterprise and big corporations is flexing its muscle. They are trying to make this as shitty as possible with the hopes that the entire country blames all of their frustration on one single man. Look, here's We're the thing. Fine. Listen, I'm gonna be honest with you. I, I'm kind of retarded. I swear, I did not pull this from some political page. Honestly, what the fuck is this guy on about? I really hope this dude is a troll because it would break my heart to know that we have Alex Jones type of people in the fan base. The people begging for Battle Royale in the next game is bad enough. Tell me how you can't just remote into your work computer from home and continue game development as normal, along with having video conferences to discuss things. This delay is most likely their own damn fault, and they're just using Corona as a scapegoat. Um, maybe that is what they're doing. Who fucking knows, but have you used video calls before? Even with better services, it's still laggy as fuck, and you're lucky to get through at all with multiple people. Quick little story, I got sick a couple months ago, it wasn't THE infection, but I did get a really bad cold, so that was pretty startling. I had to go into a video chat with a nurse to diagnose my symptoms for all this paperwork shit for my job and to get tested. Eventually I just texted my number into the chat and got called directly because trying to connect was impossible. And those video calls that online schooling is using is also trash. So I'm pretty sure a lot of developers are trying to work around COVID, but the troubleshooting that goes into trying to keep your distance from what is typically an office environment is probably a major hassle. Maybe I'm crazy, I don't know, I honestly can't tell anymore. The thing I find so gross about all these haters is they aren't constructive. They aren't giving out any insightful points. They have nothing to say outside of buzzwords and baseless assumptions. We truly don't know what's going on behind the scenes. It's just funny seeing people who have already made up their minds on the game start speculating the worst. And whatever state the game would have been in, either launching on its original schedule or after the delay, it's going to look better than the demo regardless, that's just how it goes. So I'm just deeply amused by these people. They seriously think that they are constructive critics and that their petitions are going to change shit when that's just not the case. It was also revealed that flight testing wasn't going to be a thing due to time constraints, but hopefully the delay will allow the time for beta testing. Maybe that was the idea behind the delay all along. 
So those were my thoughts on the demo. It got me excited, left me with some concerns, but those concerns were alleviated when it was announced that the game was delayed. Yeah, it sucks, but the results will be better than what we would have gotten on its original launch day. That's enough mayhem for today. What are your thoughts on Halo Infinite and the climate surrounding it? Post in the comments below, I'm curious. Make sure to like the video if you enjoyed, and of course, subscribe for more mayhem.